week seven, halfway through the semester. Don't forget, if you have midterms, you have too much to do, you find yourself having to skip a class, or you catch virus, a lot of people <laughs> sick around the campus, every class is being recorded and the videos are posted both in the class wiki and on my YouTube channels, both and, and both the wiki and the YouTube channel are public, publicly available. So if you miss a class, watch the lecture that you've missed and then come and ask me specific questions about it. During week seven, we talk about an interesting play from 1904, presented as the first Italian play on the theme of the automobile, and we'll see how that theme plays out on the stage. We will spend a little bit of time also on a series of sonnets composed by the same author, Alfredo Testoni, who um, was from Bologna, Italy, and in fact some of his works were written in the dialect of Bologna. And for our cinema component on Thursday, we have a series of silent films, some of them very short, one or two minutes, and some slightly more than 10 minutes long. They're all very interesting. They can produce stimulating discussions on the representation of the automobile. And we may be able to see all of them, or one or two will be shown later on. The week after this is also the week of the fall break. So next week, we're meeting only on Thursday. A short series of announcements. <laughs> this has nothing to do with our class, but as the director of the Center for Italian Studies, I'm the co-organizer of this event. Uh, and if anyone is interested, we have invited a prestigious guest, an Archbishop, Gabriele Caccia, who represents the Vatican, the Catholic Church, at the United Nations, he's been there since 2019. Although by title, he's a member of a clergy, he's really a diplomat, someone trained in international relations and who worked throughout his career in various areas of the world to further the international <laughs> agenda of the church. Uh, won't be a presentation, it will be a discussion. A member of the Faculty in Globalization Studies, a program with which I'm also involved, will ask a series of questions about the UN 2030 agenda and the Church, about the efforts of the Church in various areas uh, to advance conflict resolution. It's tomorrow, Wednesday, at 6 p.m. in the Wang Theater, and there is a reception to follow. A couple more announcements about the class. I'm going through the assignments. Uh, the last assignment that was posted was due uh, at the end of last week, last Friday. I've only done 20-25% of the assignments. While I'm reviewing the assignment of the Master of the World, I'm also posting grades about the last comments posted or class activities. And on Thursday, my office hours usually are right after class from 3.30 until 5, but I'll leave at 4 to attend a meeting, a workshop of the American Association of Teachers of Italian. This is the presentation that I'm using today. I've only excerpted some passages. You read everything, you find the link to this presentation under week seven. I'll talk first about the plot 
of this play called In Automobile, literally on the automobile, although in my translation the title I've used is Automobile Rides to render the true meaning of the title. Is a bourgeois play. It's all based on the development of various relationships among several characters. So I'll try to offer different ways to understand both the story and the significance of the various characters' developments. The basic story, so that you have the core in mind before we delve into the complexities, the intricacies of the details of the various scenes, is the following. A married woman, Renata, who's married to a wealthy lawyer in Florence. The play was staged the first time in 1904. And then I'll provide later some historical context about the period. So a married woman, Renata, is at risk of losing her reputation, her social standing, her honor, because she accepted the offer by a, an unmarried man, Count Rossetti, a young Florentine aristocrat, to go for an automobile ride. What was wrong about that? She accepted an offer by a bachelor who was also clearly flirting with her. And then when she got on the automobile and they left Florence to go outside of the city, she found herself in a dangerous kind of situation because they kept going. Of course, the, the play takes place in the spring between April and May. So sunset is coming, the automobile breaks down. They cannot apparently drive back to Florence. They have to go to the nearest village where they find a small pensione with a restaurant. And so all of a sudden she finds herself in this situation where she hasn't done anything wrong really, other than entertain the invitation of someone who was clearly flirtatious, but she hasn't done anything wrong. However, the optics can put cast a different light on this situation because all of a sudden she is looking at the prospect of having to spend the night outside of her house in this small inn in the company of a man, even if they take different bedrooms, it will look as if they're having an affair. So she's terribly scared. When two people are having an affair, they yeah. often exhibit certain behaviors that can be indicative Absolutely. of their relationship. These behaviors may include... The assistant is catching on the word affair and providing me with instructions. So she's paralyzed by fear, right? Part of that is her own guilt, because she knew that this automobile ride was not completely innocent. And part of that is the moralistic view of society, especially when it comes to women and what women can and cannot do, and what the effect will be on their honor and reputation. <coughs> the danger is also of this affecting her relationship with her husband, Carlo. So she convinces Count Rossetti to go back and all of a sudden it appears that the car was not broken, that it was in fact a ruse, that it was just a trick to place her in a situation where she might fall for the young Latin lover, Rossetti, is kind of a Don Juan, a typical, stereotypical Latin lover. So they go back to Florence, but she's still not safe 
because we learned that besides this automobile ride, there were letters exchanged between the two of them. Again, nothing major was in the letters other than flirtatious language, but the very fact that she entertained this correspondence with a man who's not married appeared to be dangerous, dangerous for her reputation. So she goes to her good friend, Emilio, just a friend, nothing going on between the two of them, to ask for help. By the end of the play, Emilio will concoct a plan to recover the compromising letters the letters she wrote to Count Rossetti that he has in his hands, she will be able to restore her relationship with her husband and everything will be fine in this circle of friends. What's the relevance of the automobile within the play of written by Alfredo Testoni. It's not just the fact that you have this key episode in which an automobile ride becomes an instrument of seduction or even a way to threaten the honorability and the reputation of a married woman. The real central theme of the play is marriage and social relationships in general, relationships between men and women in society altogether. But the symbolic power of the automobile is that it parallels what happens to married couples exposed to an affair that could break the relationship. That is to say, unbound, uncontrolled, passionate, romantic love is as difficult to control as this new technology. Both the use of the automobile and engaging in a romantic affair outside of the marriage or even inside the marriage between men and women, as we will see, are chaotic elements in society, are disruptive elements, because both erotic instincts and the thrill of an automobile ride are forces to reckon with, forces that can easily overpower, overwhelm the rational mind of individuals in society, even in, edu in the case of educated individuals, because all of the characters belong to the upper classes, of, to the aristocracy or to the professional upper classes in Florence. So this is the core story. A woman's honor is at risk because people might think that she's having an affair with a young man simply because they left the city and went for an automobile ride and the, they almost spent the night together and then her honor is restored and she's safe by the end. Let me provide a few more details so that you can understand. I didn't post all of the play in the required reading. I posted just the most important scenes and summaries of the scenes that you don't find verbatim in there. The first act, there are three acts, takes place in the office of Emilio, who's a lawyer, an attorney at law in the city of Florence in the early 1900s. Emilio is also the central character, the social hub, his office, is like the social hub for this circle of friends. Everyone is going to Emilio to talk about their issues, to seek his help, his advice, his support. And he's able to do so because paradoxically, in this play, in this comedy about new means of mobility, Emilio is still very anchored. Not only he doesn't have 
a car, nor does he plan to purchase one anytime soon. But in fact, his whole life is about immobility. The office where he works, where he sees some of his friends in Act One of the play, is just two flights of stairs below his apartment in Florence. His office and the apartment where he lives with his wife, Lina, are in the same building. His commute is just going down the stairs to his office or up the stairs back into his apartment. He's also immobile, not mobile, in other ways. He's not as temperamental as some of his friends, both female and male friends. Very grounded also in terms of values within the marriage itself. For example, he believes and behaves according to his beliefs that even husband and wife should not engage in excessive public manifestations, displays of affection. That moderation and balance are the key to a successful marriage. <coughs> so at the beginning of the story, Emilio is working in his office, receives the visit of an old friend, a senior member of his circle, Marchi Angelo, who is the leader of the Conservative Party. There is an election in the city for the city council. Emilio is running for a seat in the council as a radical, as a secular politician, right? As a reformist. Angelo, as the member of the competing Conservative Party, comes to visit Emilio to apologize because he has learned that the newspaper of his party has published a negative article about Emilio with all kinds of accusations. They're saying things that threaten to ruin his political campaign, his reputation vis-a-vis -vis the electoral body in town. While they're there, Two more friends come by, Baron Ferrucci, another member of the aristocracy, a middle-aged man, and the young Count Rossetti, the Latin lover, the bachelor. These two friends are coming to seek Emilio's legal advice because the following happened. Rossetti borrowed, uh, yes, Count Rossetti borrowed one of Ferrucci's cars. And in fact, we know the readers know that this is the car that he used to take Renata out of town, pretending then that the car broke down to, so that she would spend the night in the same inn, creating the premise for some kind of romantic encounter. And the day after Rossetti returned the car, Baron Ferrucci received summons because there is a cyclist who says that Rossetti hit him on his bicycle and caused injuries and damages to his clothes and the bicycle. There is a dog owned by a farmer that apparently, allegedly, was injured. His legs were broken by the car. So Ferrucci is being sued, but it's not the driver. However, Rossetti doesn't want to appear in a court of law to say that he was driving. And more importantly, he's refusing to get the woman that was with him involved. Rossetti saying, the passenger who was with me can testify that the cyclist was not seriously injured. And the woman who was with me on the car can testify that the dog was not injured seriously, that he was running around after the car left. But bringing the woman to testify would also expose her and place her honor at risk. 
since she was in the car with Rossetti, but she's married to another man. So Emilio tells them, I'm just glad you got this lesson, right? That you got this kind of punishment because going after cars, being taken by this mania for automobiles and speed is not a healthy habit. And therefore, it's only fair that you learn your lesson this way. After these friends have communicated their situation, a group of women comes in. Among them is Lina, Emilio's wife, younger than Emilio, really enthusiastic. We also learn that she's very religious. She represents this kind of stereotypical religious woman in Italian society from that era. And Lina also, and, and the other women, are seeking Emilio's help because as Catholic women, they want to put together a book of poetry to honor a local preacher, Gaudenzio, Father Gaudenzio. And they want Emilio to write the verses. And Emilio says, I'm running for a seat as a radical, as a member of the radical party, which is anti-clerical, against the church, and a secular party. My reputation would be ruined if people know that I'm writing verses for a preacher. However, in order to satisfy her uh, wife's desires, Emilio will, in fact, help them with those poems. And later on, this will, in fact, help him get elected. At the end of the play, we learn that Emilio was elected to the city council exactly because some of the Catholics voted for him. They knew him to be an anti-clerical radical, but the rumor was going around that he, in fact, is not such a strong anti-clerical because he wrote poems to celebrate a preacher. Grazia also comes in during the first act. Grazia is Baron Ferrucci's wife, and during the scene, we learned that Emilio and Grazia had an affair before Emilio was married. And it's clear that Grazia would like to rekindle that relationship. But Emilio is firm in saying that now he's married and this would not be, again, conducive to a balanced, healthy relationship. Notice that there is no mention anywhere of sin. Right? They're not talking about the sanctity of marriage when it comes to Renata and Rossetti or Emilio and Grazia. The values that preserve the uh, fidelity of the couple are all secular values in this play. So, as I said, um, by the end of the play, the potential threats, the potential disruptions caused by the automobile and by various affairs are diffused. For example, Renata comes up with a plan. If she finds out that her husband has a lover himself, then her indiscretions should be forgiven by her husband. And then they can start their relationship on an equal footing and try to rebuild their relationship. She tells Emilio she needs help finding this lover. She's sure that Carlo has a lover. Why? Because he is giving her too many gifts. He's being too affectionate. And she finds that this is suspicious on his part. That, he's doing, that he must be doing so because he's trying to make up for the, an affair that he is having. And in fact, uh, Emilio and Renata will discover that Elena, a young widow, is having an affair with Carlo. So in this group of friends who belong to the same circle, you have a series of married couples in 
various degrees of success, marital success, right? For example, Ferrucci and Grazia, neither of them are having an affair, is having an affair, but we know that Grazia would like to, if given a chance. And what is the element that affects the good balance and health of this relationship? Clearly, it's the fact that Ferrucci is taken by the mania for the automobile. He's too interested, more interested in his automobiles than in his wife. Emilio and Lina are having a little bit of trouble. Again, no affairs involved. The issue here is that Lina would like Emilio to be more affectionate, especially in public. And by the end, Emilio will change a little bit, will show more affection towards his wife. And the first step, of course, was accepting to write the poetry uh, that his wife requested to celebrate a preacher, even though he's an anti-clerical. Renata and Carlo have an issue, exactly because Carlo is not giving his wife the appropriate amount of attention. So both in the case of Renata and Carlo and Emilio and, Gra and, Emilio and Lina, it's what kind of attention and how much attention you give that is at stake, that may threaten the balance. As I said, even within the marriage, nothing should be excessive, not even love. And then you have two people who are not married, relatively young people in their 20s, a bachelor, Count Rossetti, who's having, trying to have an affair with Renata, trying to blackmail her uh, after the failed attempt at the automobile ride. He tries to blackmail her because of the letters she wrote to him. But this is not the first time he's had an affair or tried to have one. And Elena is a widow, so she's a free woman. She's rich, right? She belongs to the upper middle class herself or the upper class. She's rich. She doesn't have family or a husband to control her and restrain her behavior. That's why she pursues Carlo in an excessive way. Again, lack of balance is a pattern throughout the play. What's excessive about this is that she loves him too much. She wants to be with him too often. And Carlo starts to resent the relationship, the affair, simply because the lover, the mistress, is too demanding. And this is one of the paradoxes used turning to comedy in this play that a married man has a more tranquil life than someone with an affair because the lover is serious about the relationship, whereas... A bourgeois marriage is more peaceful, right? Because love is not the key element in it. So what happens to these disruptive elements in society? By the end of the play, in order to neutralize Elena threatening this couple and Rossetti threatening the same couple by engaging with Renata, they're forced to get married. And the marriage proposal will involve an automobile. <coughs> At the end of the play, they're in Renata and Carlo's villa outside of Florence. It's night, the guests are going back to Florence and they make it so that Rossetti and Elena go back to the city with the same car. The moon is out, it's a wonderful night in May and all the elements are such, the automobile rides, the stars and the moon, the air, that uh, it's slight, slightly exciting, are such that Elena will have to say yes to this proposal. And therefore, once married, they will not cause as much trouble as they did before. A little bit of the background. What was going on in Italy around that time? The most important thing to keep in mind is that by 1904, Italy was a very young nation. 
Italy was partially unified only in 1861. Because until 1859, in Italy, you would have found about a dozen different independent states. And without national unification, of course, the assumption was that there would be no progress. And this, is, this was true in many ways, because separate states in Italy meant that, for example, every state, and sometimes even within a small state, every town had different standards for measures. So a foot, a yard, a pound was measured differently in Italy, sometimes 80 times, 100 times. There is a great book by an officer, an army officer, published in the 1830s with table after table to be used by merchants, by people doing transactions, selling and buying across the Italian peninsula so that they could see if they were buying 100 pounds of wheat, what it was actually if they bought it in Forlì or Venice or Rome or Naples. All these states had different currencies. Of course, they had different laws. Many of them had different languages, which you call dialects these days, but they were different enough that in the 19th century they would publish bilingual dictionaries, pocket bilingual dictionaries, again, for merchants and other travelers going to different places in Italy so that they could understand the language of the Venetians or the Milanese or the Neapolitans and the Sicilians. So, 1861, the process of unification begins and will not be completed until 1918, but then the borders, the national borders, will be revised at the end of World War II in 1946. What's interesting in terms of culture is that the unification of Italy happens without the support and with the opposition direct or indirect opposition of the church. Which goes back to what I was saying before, to the fact that the values in this play about marriage are not based on the scriptures. They're not based on the Ten Commandments. They're all based on a secular kind of culture. Because that was the predominant culture of that time. In fact, the church suffered a territorial loss not only a loss of social relevance in Italy at that time, Rome and the surrounding area in central Italy was controlled by the Pope. The Pope was a political leader until in 1870 the Italian army broke into the walls of Rome and you can still see uh, if you visit the place where the battle was fought you can still see the um, traces on the walls of the artillery projectiles shot at the wall. And that's how you get the Pope being confined to Vatican City, which is a very, very small state. So the unified new Italian society is built upon secular values rather than the traditional Catholic values. Those will be reintroduced in Italian society later on. Even fascism at the beginning was anti-Catholic, fundamentally. Then they came to an agreement with the church and things started to change in the 1930s and things changed even more after the war when Italy for a long period during the Cold War was controlled by a Christian Democrat party who formed the government every single time. Within this new society, theater had an educational mission. So both the playwrights, the producers, the owners of the theaters were very well aware of the fact that whatever they put on stage should have some educational value in terms of social practices, okay? So everything in this play about marriage is a way to educate people about a model of marriage that is not based on the scriptures or the commandments. Keep that in mind. 
chief among all the values. And you can understand that in the context of a new society, of a unified nation that had to build an identity, bring people from different contexts, different backgrounds together. The chief value is stability and harmony. And that, of course, happens both within these married couples and society in general. Notice how interesting it is to find two of the main characters being lawyers, but they're modern kind of professionals. For example, when Angelo, the Marquis, comes to talk to Emilio about an article that is casting a negative light on him as a political candidate, he says that the article is implying that as a lawyer, he is serving all kinds of customers, meaning even criminals or possibly prostitutes, because he is a secular professional. His profession is not governed by traditional, conventional, moral values. As a lawyer, he has to serve all kinds of customers because this is what a modern professional will do. He cannot take a moralistic attitude in regards to his clientele and say, I will not defend hard criminals or prostitutes. Okay? So it's clearly the proposition of new social models that you find at the basis of this play. And Ferrucci, the baron who's being sued for the alleged damages caused by the car driven by Count, uh, the, the young Count Rossetti, will lose the trial, will have to play, pay a lot of money because he is refusing to involve a woman because of her honor, but this is kind of an outdated mindset. The fact that he loses is an example of punishment. It shows indirectly that you cannot rely on those outdated kinds of values. In terms of stability, there is a scene where the clerks, the employees working in Emilio's office, get into a fight because they belong to two different parties. And this goes to show that even democracy cannot be expanded to a point where it could precipitate society into chaos. What are the powers that are recognized in Italian society through the characters of the play, and what's the judgment on them? There is the traditional kind of power, right? There is still an aristocracy in Italy, and there are characters who have an aristocratic title, Marche Angelo, Baron Ferrucci, Count Rossetti. There is the church. Remember the reference to the preacher for whom even Emilia will have to compose poetry. And clearly, traditionally, the aristocracy, the church, the monarchy are allied with the populace, right? They're trying to manipulate the populace to get support by resorting to, of course, an appeal to the traditional values of religion, of morality, etc. The new upcoming power, though, is represented by the characters such as Emilio and his friend Carlo, the lawyers. They're a kind of social aristocracy. They're, they have wealth, they have power and influence, but they're professionals, right? Their power is based on their abilities and their business, so they represent the future. And then there is also the implication, the implied acknowledgement of the concept that I introduced in reference, for example, to the lightning conductor, this idea of the natural aristocracy. The idea that anyone who by nature has been endowed with leadership skills will be afforded a better degree of mobility 
compared to societies in the past. Because without this, there is no progress. If the traditional powers used, held by the church, the monarchy, in an, in an, ally, in an unholy alliance with the populace, will keep natural leaders down, then the full potential of a nation is not realized. Okay, so keep in mind natural aristocracy, which is of course a concept crudely derived by from Darwin's The Origin of the Species. Then there is more, a very important concept in Italian society, in Europe in general, even the US at the time, was the concept of social hygiene, which is connected in turn to the idea of progress. There is no progress if the citizens of a community are not living a healthy life with healthy practices when it comes to relationships as well. It's called social hygiene because it pertains relationships, social or marital relationships, but also it involves not just the mind, but also the body. From that point of view, an affair is considered not healthy or less healthy than a marriage. Not just something morally bad, but something that is bad also for the psyche and the body of the people involved, or the people who are affected by it, such as the spouses. Social hygiene means, even within the marriage, there shouldn't be any kind of mania or obsession. Hence, the parallel between the affairs brought to an extreme by a very demanding mistress and the car as the new mania. Any kind of obsessive attachment, even between husband and wife, is condemned. Even between husband and wife, there should be everything in moderation, including sex. And there is another interesting Italian play from the same period, which is exactly the story of a couple. He's a stockbroker who lives a very stressful life because he's handling millions and business is not going well. And a young wife who's too much in love and asking for sex too often. And this husband, who's under pressure already, who's suffering from enormous levels of stress, by the end of the play will end up in a mental hospital because of the excessive demands from her wife. And there is a scene where the doctor who has visited the husband who's suffering is telling the woman to refrain, to restrain herself, to refrain from asking uh, for sex so often because this will in turn stress the husband's mind even more. Okay? But all of this is done to provide a different kind of foundation for a marriage compared to traditional morality. Again, keep in mind that there is no reference to the religious view of the marriage. Interestingly, there are no couples with children, only the old couple, Angelo and Marianna, have children, but the younger couples don't have children because, again, this is not, they, they want to stay away from the traditional models for marriage and, and relationship gears oriented towards procreation. But what is that replaces having children in terms of what's important in the couple's dynamics? Efficiency and energy. Having an affair is a big expenditure of energies, mental energies, physical energies, and it's not an efficient way to bring life, to, be, to bring love into one's life, okay? Of course, an affair can be ruinous. Again, they're trying to replace traditional morality with something else. So instead of saying, if you have an affair, you'll go to hell, it's a sin. They're saying, well, 
your freedom will be limited. Because the mistress can be more demanding than the wife because the mistress is not under the authority of the man. The same way that instead, in this kind of bourgeois marriage, the wife is supposed to be subordinate to the husband, subject to his authority. Of course, you'll have to spend time and energies uh, in, for, for, to cultivate your affair, but this will be stressful on your mind because you live in constant fear of a scandal, right? And we see the effect on the nerves of various characters, how this fear of being exposed affects them mentally, right? And in terms of your public image, they're using an economic model you've invested into your reputation, into your social persona. So why threaten it with an affair that can ruin everything in the space of a short time? As I said, justice linked to religious beliefs is not represented in this group. And they don't want to suggest that you should simply conform to moral values, the moral values of the past, because everyone is doing it by imitation. The assumption is that you have to reason on this and that your rational choice should be to stay married in a relationship that is balanced, that is not primarily founded on love or erotic attraction. Okay, it's important to understand this, to see beyond the surface of the text and catch the moral lessons, the educational uh, function of the play itself. Um, the elections, I mentioned the elections that are held in the city of Florence during the play where Emilio will end up getting elected. The participants, the, the political parties represented in the elections are the conservatives, who also are the supporters of the monarchy, the aristocrats, the Catholics, the radicals like Emilio, who are rationalists, pragmatists, people who want progress and social reforms based on rational decisions. And then the revolutionaries. The fourth group is both anarchists and socialists. And in the play, the aristocrats are represented, are called, labeled representatives of the past. The Catholics are the distant past. No, no one can build a modern life based on the values of the Bible. The radicals, those who want reform, are the present. And the revolutionaries, those who want radical reform, are the future. However, keep in mind that throughout Europe during that period, socialists are often seen as democratic reformists, not people who want to bring chaos into society or support a revolution such as the one that will happen in Russia in 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution. An interesting theme related to the automobile is the idea of mobility and promiscuity. This idea that if you live your existence in a small place where everybody knows who you are, then you are subject constantly to the gaze and the judgment of, the, of people who can expose your behavior if it is not conforming to the rules. For example, a woman going out with a man who's not married could be accused of having an affair. Once you change mobility by introducing a car, whereby you can quickly leave the city of Florence and go to any of the villages nearby where no one knows whether you and the man with you are a married couple or not, then promiscuity seems to be easier. Uh, even Lina, who's extremely faithful and in fact almost a bigot 
they attach to religion, is at some point accused, suspected of having an affair simply based on the fact that she left her apartment in Florence, took the train, went to visit her mother, and on the train was by herself. And the suspicion is that, in fact, she didn't go straight to Rome, that she might have stopped at one of the stations between Florence and Rome to meet with a lover in a place where nobody knew they were not married, this man and this woman. Okay? I said before how the widow, Elena, is a truly free and independent woman because she doesn't have a husband to check on her, to see what she's doing, where she's going, to impose rules and authority, traditional authority on her. And therefore, as a free, completely free woman, she becomes too demanding with Carlo. Among the various models that are applied to the play are those of supply and demand, right? In the couple, there should be the appropriate amount of attention given by the husband to the wife, and the wife should reciprocate appropriately, again, without going into any kind of extreme behavior. So, in the case of Renata, she is motivated into accepting the automobile ride with a young bachelor because she's not feeling the, that she's receiving the appropriate kind of attention. Not the amount, as I said. She knows that something is going on because her husband is too attentive, but she knows that this is not appropriate level of attention. And to feel attractive, she will engage in a flirtatious behavior with the young bachelor, the Latin lover, Rossetti. In terms of attention, too much attention demanded by Elena, the mistress, sends his lover, Renata's husband, away, back to his wife, because there he can maintain a healthy kind of balance. And all of this is rendered in a materialistic way, again, not a moralistic way. For example, there is a key metaphor in the play where they say that having an affair is like eating outside of the house too often, which is not good for your health, right? It's not natural kind of nutrition. Keep in mind, as a background, that around this time, a very common way to represent women was by leveraging the theory of female hysteria, which entered the field of medicine and biology, and then was, of course, proven false. Cesare Lombroso was a famous anthropologist and criminologist and devoted several books to female criminals, and he described, I reported here several quotes, the symptoms of female hysteria in a way that is quite similar to the behavior shown, displayed by Renata when she talks to Emilio about her affair, right? But why is this relevant? Because the idea is that something like an automobile ride can have a powerful effect on uh, this kind of woman, right? Who, who is so sensitive. Let's look at just a few passages. Meanwhile, I'll circulate the attendance. This is the beginning of the play where Marque Angelo is visiting his friend Emilio, the lawyer and the candidate to the city council for the radical party. And notice the materialistic approach. 
the constant references to the materiality of the body. So, Angelo has come to announce that there was a negative article against Emilio published in this conservative newspaper, La Politica, Politics. And notice Emilio's answer to this. Ever since I stepped into the fray of these blessed election, city elections, I have not read the newspapers. I care too much about the health of my digestive process, right? Which brings back, brings us back to the themes of balance, right? I want to keep my balance. And the material consequences of good or bad practices and behaviors. So it's not about morality. It's, he's not saying, oh yes, this is a bad article. Whoever did it, whoever wrote the article against me is a bad person. No, he's saying, I want to stay balanced. I don't want this, reading this article to affect my body, my mental stress. And as I said before, this is a key line about models for professionals in that new society of Italy after unification. Angelo is saying, they say that you, sir, that is Emilio, welcome all kinds of clients. So the traditional idea is that a moral lawyer should not entertain people who are immoral as customers, certain kinds of criminals, for example. And Emilio, instead, is a new kind of lawyer, a pragmatic professional, and he thinks that his profession is about defending all kinds of customers. He says, he responds by saying, if a lawyer had to have only honest folks as clients, he could as well close shop. They'll probably say, I'm a priest hater. We know it's anti-clerical that I'm crazy about women, but here Emilio is joking, right? Because we'll see how with his wife is even too moderate, refuses to engage in any kind of public display of affection. And later on in this scene, they talk about speed as the staple of modern society. Modern society is about speed, not just in reference to the use of the cars, but in general, in modern society, everything has to happen quickly. So Angela is still apologizing for the excessive critical language in the article published by the conservative newspaper. And Emilio says, I agree that it isn't so modern, but nowadays, even insults must be uttered quickly and be condensed. We don't have time for anything. We don't have time to reason, to reflect. He's very rational. And in the same way that the horse has been replaced by the automobile to arrive sooner, impetuousness has taken the place of reasoning. I understand that by doing this, we risk breaking our neck much more easily. However, this is life. And Continuing in the dialogue, the Marquis will admit that even he, as an older man and a conservative aristocrat, has been taken by the mania for the automobile, and he has kept that secret hidden from his wife, the Marquise, but he's also losing his balance because of this powerful, seductive technology. Here is... Emilio talking about the political debates and how they bring chaos, entropy in his office, the fact that his employees, his clerks at his lawyer's office are fighting so much that he had to assign them to separate rooms. And this is an apologue for the excesses of democracy. Even democracy has to have some kind of balance. This is when Emilio receives in his office Ferrucci and Rossetti, who are all worried about this potentially destructive, damaging lawsuit being brought against the owner of the car, Ferrucci, even though he was not the driver. And notice the reaction by Emilio. 
laughing. He says, let me guess, another automobile accident. And then you know that I have an aversion for the automobile. And as I said, he's the least mobile of all the characters working underneath his apartment. Therefore, I feel a ton of joy when I know that my sporting friends, remember how the automobile was classified as, as a sport, have accidents that cost them a lot of money. Those accidents and that money, in his mind, should be punishment, a lesson taught to make them change their mind. Another paradox of mobility is that Ferrucci, who's being sued for the alleged damages caused by Rossetti when he drove Ferrucci's car, is saying that he's not using the car to go around. He's using the car to go see the lawyers, visit the victims of various accidents. Okay, So the car seems to be improductive, right? There is nothing good that the car adds to these characters' life. And notice here how a parallel, parallel is drawn between the mania for the car and a manic, obsessive relationship for a mistress or a lover. The automobile, according to Ferrucci, is like a woman that you like. She makes you angry, she costs you money, but you chase after her. And Emilio adds, both the car and the woman, in the end, make you run away. Both can be disruptive in your life. This is the description by Renata of the events of that fateful evening when she went for an automobile ride with the young Latin lover Rossetti, but the car broke down or seemed to appear to break down, uh, forcing them to spend the night outside of their homes, exposing her to a potential scandal. I agreed to an automobile ride with him. The agreement follows the courting by Rossetti, and we know that because of the lack of balance between attention, between the husband in, in supply and demand of attention in, in their couple, she wanted the attentions from Rossetti she wasn't getting from her husband. So they go for the automobile ride. We left, but after we reached, I don't know what village, this is important. I don't know what village means a place I've never been. And that's the idea of promiscuity and mobility. If the automobile ride takes you to a place where no one knows who you are, then your self-inhibition, your self-censorship is lowered because whatever you do, people will not be able to tell about it. However, you still have the risk of someone there knowing you, right? Because after all, they're just half an hour, an hour outside of Florence. And so, says Emilio, you had to stop at the first thing. Wrong, the proverb warns us about it. It's an Italian proverb that says not to stop at the first thing because it's not necessarily the best, right? But the inn creates the premise for the possibility of a sexual tryst, right? Because they're spending the night together there, she's by herself, etc. <clears throat> As I said before, she manages to convince Rossetti to come back and all of a sudden the car is working again and they're able to go back there. Notice the negative description of the automobile ride. The moralistic view of the technology, everything associated with it, is negative. We came back racing in the dark, like crazy, exactly the same way I had behaved. We only exchanged a few words. I couldn't shake the sensation of cold that I felt all over. Of course, they're an open, open top car driving at night, so it's the cold air and the coldness that she feels because of her guilt. He was more preoccupied with the car than with me. All of a sudden, the car has taken over the attention of the man. I could already see in him the man who was upset for not being able to triumph over a whim 
he was not able to have sex with her at the inn in this rural village and so you can see his rage but his rage is communicating through his driving style right this idea that we found in several illustrations and texts that the car takes empathy out of you and brings more easily brings over the rage in you and then my dear friend the smell of gasoline of course gasoline was not completely burned inside the engines of the cars from that period so it's natural that you would smell the gasoline to the point where there is a famous a legendary uh, automobile driver from the 1930s 20s 30s and 40s who drove for 30 years and who suffered from uh, a problem with his lungs which was probably caused by uh, breathing the uh, and the, the gasoline that was not burned in the engine from his cockpit. Okay, so this is the negative representation of the car by Renata. And this, towards the end, in the third act, this is when Emilio and Carlo convince Count Rossetti that he has to take Elena back and propose. And this is all, the only way to avoid any kind of scandal or revenge by the husband of Renata. My compliments and have a good ride with a young widow, Elna. No, no, you have to go with her. What the hell? After what you've confessed to me, it is more than natural. This poetic little trip of yours, the stars are shining in the sky, right? They're going with the automobile. And Carlo adds to this, at night on the automobile, you and her alone, you will get carried away by the excitement. It's this idea that the automobile is like Cupid, that the automobile will facilitate romantic <laughs> liaisons. The air will stimulate you. There is not just the emotional part, but the physical part as well. And declarations will be more impulsive because on the car you cannot apply your reason and you cannot be rational on the car. It will have a greater effect etc. And this, in fact, is what happens.